Welcome everybody to Fighting Words. 25 years of provocative poetry and prose from the blue collar pen. Um, so this is a reading open for the public and it also has uh, many of the students, or should be all of the students from my poetry class tonight. Um, for my poetry students, just for a little bit of housekeeping, there is a sign-in sheet um, by the door, and you could also pick up your poems that I've been commenting on all morning uh, in the blue file, and the hot file, the red file, is to put in your new poems, and there is a little poetry prompt. If you haven't done it yet, um, pick it up, and you can do it, um, or just write a new poem for next week, and we'll be there. Okay. I just want to welcome everybody. It's just a beautiful crowd and um, a beautiful evening that we're going to have. Um, and it's celebrating the 25 years of, of Penn um, here in the West Coast. Um, Penn Center um, USA is an organization of, of poets and writers and translators and journalists, playwrights, uh, screenwriters, people writing and producing. Um, and its mission statement is to stimulate the ma um, and maintain interest in the written word, to foster a vital literary culture, and to defend freedom of expression domestically and internationally. Um, and they do a lot of work with that, um, work with uh, making sure um, the protection of journalists, um, the protection of people having access to the written word um, wherever they are, whatever governmental institution they've been put into, um, meaning the prisons, et cetera, to make sure that they have access um, to um, the written word and to getting their writing out. Um, along with other centers in the world, Penn Center advocates for the release of imprisoned writers and for the protection of writers who suffer political pro um, um, prosecution, persecution, and censorship. The organization also produces a lot of programming for writing communities, um, and that includes, boy, um, grants for emerging writers, especially from those from um, historically and currently oppressed um, communities, um, grants for translators, um, advice and um, help with for editors and agents, um, booksellers, um, they send, um, they have programs to um, put writers in the classroom to help um, teach writing at a really professional level to, to children. Um, and um, they also have a resource library um, that you can look at. I highly recommend taking a look at their webpage for all that they offer. And they also offer literary awards. So every December here in um, Oakland, there is an awards ceremony where um, I know a number of the readers who are reading here, if not all of them, have been there winning awards, being awarded, um, or appreciating others for awards. So um, I'm going to um, call up our first reader, Claire um, Ortado, who is also one of the editors of this anthology, and she's going to tell you a bit more about Penn and this anthology. And um, just let you know a little bit about Claire. Um, Claire is the treasurer and founder of Penn Oakland and is an award-winning fiction writer and a poet whose work has been published in numerous literary journals. Her short story, A Village Dog, was winner of the Georgia State University Fiction Prize. And her poem, Iowa, was nominated for a Pushcock um, Prize. Um, other awards and mentions include the Hackney Literary Award, Fugue Fiction Award, and the Chesterfield Writers Film Project. Paramount Pictures. Um, she has a children's book called The Stair in the Wall, um, and she's also 
an editor for Narrative Magazine and for The Other Side of the Closet, um, IBS Press, and Financial Sanity. And let's give her a really warm welcome. Uh, what Sharon um, discussed was uh, a lot about the, uh, um, she told me ahead of time if I, if, if I wanted to add anything to her, um, to her um, discourse about Penn to do so. And uh, a lot of that was about our parent organization and it was all true and we all subscribed to that. Penn Oakland was, was started though to specifically target multicultural issues and, and uh, so let me, let me just launch into that a little bit. We are actually sometimes in opposition <laughs> to our parent organization <laughs> uh, because we are pushing um, the voices that are not heard. Of course, that's part of it, um, um, but sometimes we're, the voices that are not heard are not just in some third world country, they're in our country. And that's what we wanted to make clear. Uh, Floyd gave a wonderful speech uh, saying exactly that uh, to the to the Pan International Organization. <clears throat> okay, the idea, and I, do, I just want to, before I, I launch, I want to say that I wanted to thank Kim McMillan. This was her idea. This book was her idea. It was her, yes. <laughs> Many of you know Kim. She is such a mover and a shaker in the literary world. And Judith Cody then was handed the baton and worked pretty much silently and alone for years and years editing this, communicating with the writers, all of you who are in it know that she, had, you know, did you really want this comma here? You know, she was, she was wonderful. Okay, so here we are. The idea behind Fightin' Words was to record Penn Oakland's 25 years of what you could call literary activism. That is, activism in recognition of the fact that what gets printed and what does not has tremendous implications for the culture at large. In that some cultures are marginalized or villainized or just plain ignored. One of our first and biggest efforts in that vein was our media boycott in 1991. Spearheaded by a number of well-placed articles by Ishmael Reed, the uh, founder, Penn Oakland launched its most audacious and publicized event, a nationwide call for a 30-day tune-out of prime network news. This was ABC, CBS, NBC, and CNN. To protest televised racism, including depiction of minorities, and to highlight the lack of a significant number of minority women and alternate voice journalists in major newsrooms. An open mic at Lakeside Garden Center in Oakland, attended by more than 400 people. I know Jack and Adele remember that one, and Floyd. Kick, uh, kicked off a nationwide series of lectures and readings to discuss media abuses of women and people of different ethnic and religious backgrounds and sexual orientations. The media boycott received coverage in the New York Times, it, uh, also on ABC TV's San Francisco affiliate, you know, our Channel 7. The Washington Post, Spin Magazine, The Nation, and many other nationwide news forums. Besides the media boycott over the years, we have given many symposia, as well as our Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Literary Awards and our Censorship Award, Awards, inaugurated to promote works of excellence by writers of all cultural and racial backgrounds. We also have produced four dramatic events, including um, domestic crook. Crusaders, a play about a Muslim Pakistani American family's efforts to deal with the aftermath of 9 11. Included among our winners and panelists at these events were such notable figures as Irish Ch Iris Chang, the late author of The Rape of Nanking. She very sadly committed suicide after that. It, it, not because of our event, <laughs> but it was very, very sad of it. Daniel Ellsberg of the Pentagon Papers, Paul Krasner, Bill Moyers, Norman Mailer, Greg Palas, Kitty Kelly, Barbara Lee, our own Barbara Lee, and Gary Webb, who died tragically. His death, in fact, mysteriously in a bathtub, they called it suicide, was it? Uh, was many believe in direct, direct response to his expose, Dark Alliance, the CIA, the Contras, and the crack cocaine explosion. Basically, the premise of that book was that the CIA was financing the fight against the Nicaraguans by selling cheap crack cocaine 
in black neighborhoods. And people didn't like his message, okay? He died. Uh, so we honored him. Uh, this book was honored by Penn with the Censorship Award, Penn Oakland, with the Censorship Award in 1999. So tonight we have a range of styles and messages from contributors to this book, which will give you an idea of what I'm talking about. That Penn Oakland seeks to expose uncomfortable secrets and to honor near invisible cultures and generally encourage a political and literary atmosphere where writers can say pretty much darn near anything they want to say. No censorship, true freedom. Okay, so my piece, I'm segueing. <laughs> my piece is called Nobody. And um, I'm not gonna read it all because it's too long. Uh, it's not really poetry for those of you in the poetry class. It's kind of a prose poem. Um, so I'm going to skip here and there in it, but let me just start out by saying that the I character, the viewpoint character, is a, uh, a singer in a, in a very popular band with um, CDs, and so a touring band, a touring group. Okay, here she is, Nobody. <clears throat> my songs are the stories of my dreams, and the lyrics come from the street. I was the first to dye my hair in spots like a leopard, to let it hang high and knotted like a circus pony, to dress in silks the color of birds. All this and the pounding bass of my drummer, the writhing cry of my sax player, the wail of my lead guitarist, like the arc of a live power line. We always touch the soul, and that's why our gigs cover the globe, and that's why I saw what I saw. Riots in London, burning down, burning down. The streets thick with bobbies. People thronging the streets and squares of Greece, Egypt, Syria, Libya, Moscow, New York, Oakland. Occupy, occupy, tear gas and batons and beanbags and rockets and live ammo and tanks and Al-Qaeda and IEDs. The poison tsunami has hit our shores. The pelican starves blackly in the oil slick. The world's been stolen. You've given us no choice. Our song, Infanticide, rose to the top of the charts in three days. Why bother to give birth to this generation then steal our future? Kill the baby in the womb or leave it exposed on the hillside. Save time, save tax dollars, save all that wasted commodity you call love because there's no such thing without hope. And no, you and your generation didn't have it tougher. We've got it tougher because we've got nothing. The world has united to say one thing to us. In the end was the word, and the word is no. No jobs, no place to live, no country to call our own, our vote an inky sham, our education and indoctrination into denial. We thrash and pace like zoo animals caged. On the streets, your limo splashes us with the gutter, gutter water of our trash dreams. No, no, and no. I scream it, back so arched the tail of my hair touches the stage, sacks like a missile tearing the sky, drum beat like bullets, guitar the electric arc of the torture. At this point, I'm skipping, the crowd begins texting her that they cannot, in their own lives, take any more no's, no more no's. And that's when I lay down on the stage, right on the edge where the front rowers could touch me and extended my wrist to the crowd, and somebody cut me, and I bled just a little. And the no's came, texted to me. They worked so hard, they played the game, they studied the book, they tried for fame, and no, no, no. No to the job, no to the college slot, no to the money, no to the apartment, no to the house, no medical care, no benefits, no respect, no interview, no scholarship, no audition. Not a nix, yet, no baby. On the bench, off the team, and we can see the future and nothing's going to change except we'll be old with the no instead of young with the no. 
The screen glitters with everything we're told we want, and life brings us nothing. We're going to get old without stories, without accomplishment. We have no place. Our dreams are dust, and there will be no babies born of this generation. Just like the best aphrodisiac is the brain, the cleanest infanticide is a cherry-flavored condom. I read their text over the mic, and they echo back over the masked dark heads, and the phones wave with light, and I lay down. Now, every show, I lie down for them. They cut me, my wrists, my legs, my stomach, and I bleed for them because I love them, because I am them, because I scream for them up here. Their no text becomes song in my throat. I bear more and more of myself to them, and their starving vampire souls want more real estate of flesh. I sing nearly naked to show there is nothing left of me to give, but still they text their no's. Skipping ahead again. She, finally, she gets cut very badly and is actually dying on the stage. She's, fa she's fading. Even the LED lights of their texting phones held high, their nose swooshing in electronic illumination over the heads by the thousands, even that light dims. I can only hear now, and it is the sound of a small river, and within my breast, just the tiniest stirring of wings. And then the river slows its flow, and there is warmth in my breast, and on my breast, and I think I hear them singing. My fans are singing, they're singing all together. Their voices sway as if they have linked hands and they are singing in one voice. Oh, sing in one voice. Sing in a language of your own. Teach one another the lyrics of yes. Thank you. Our next reader is Floyd Salas. He's a president and co-founder of Penn Oakland and is the author of eight books, including novels and books of poetry. His poetry books are called um, Color of My Living Heart and Love Bites, Poetry in Celebration of Dogs and Cats. Um, his award-winning first novel, Tattoo the Wicked Cross, along with his memoir, Buffalo Nickel, are featured in masterpieces of Hispanic literature at Harper's and Collins. His first historical novel, Whittle's Weed, is available on Kindle. Uh, he has many, many awards. Um, he's been the regent lecturer at the University of California. He's been a staff writer for the N NBC drama series Kingpin um, and um, the recipient of an NEA, California Arts Council grants, Rockefeller Foundation, and many others. And we're just so lucky to be here, have him. And if you go and talk to him afterwards, he'll trick you. So long ago, uh, mainly like 1960, 61, I started teaching tuition at San Francisco State Union, uh, San Francisco State University, okay? From that moment on, my life changed forever, okay? And from that day on, not a day goes by that I'm not watched by the FBI. Gotcha, okay? That's where I, that's where I come from, okay? Now, don't feel sorry for me. Clap, okay? <laughs> The politics of poetry. After a while, they disconnected the wire from my finger and connected it to my ear. They immediately gave a high dose of electricity. My whole body shook in a terrible way. My front teeth started breaking. At the same time, my torturers would hold a mirror to my face and say, look what is happening to your leggy green eyes soon you will not be able to see at all. You will lose your mind. You see, you've already started bleeding in your mouth. Torture tactics in Turkey, an urgent appeal on behalf of hundreds of thousands of innocent victims now suffering the tortures of the damned, Amnesty International, USA. But there's more to torture than a cell. There's a different kind of hell secret hush of the police sighing over the snail trails of bookworms sticking to the leaves of the library. Those fakes and piping tweeds, just as hard as the street dudes, only wearing a sheepskin over the weeds, or the lines of your smiling face, the sense of the lie 
behind your grinning teeth. Take them out and dip them in a glass swimming with solvent. Murky clouds of lime that will dissolve them in time. Dark swords on the calcium. Can't you see it? Think. I've never been able to say a word for fear it will be heard and transmuted and computed and filed in the appropriate place. Deep underground with leaden walls to shrink your balls. Catch even your cocktail chatter or the privacy of your bedroom when you grimace at the mirror and cry in your secret heart. Caught in the web, gossamer traces of it brush your face when you enter a doorway. Whispers that still hang in the air, faint fluttering of skirts and hum of static. The pretty girls with robes on, beckoning, beckoning. You, like the animal, come home from the hunt in the heat, the battle fought, needing love and the musky smell of sex, carrying your offering wrapped in puffs of cotton with a red silk ribbon and a bow, the selfish beast caged down inside, and the angel let loose with beating wings so hard it makes you thirst. Cushion the force of my lust with your lips, the surge up the middle, the love like bone holding my head up and my dick. But she doesn't love you, secret agent of the police state set out to warm your heart. Listen, there is more to torture than the costume of the cell. There is, of that hell, there is more to torture than the blow, the kick in the nuts, the knee in the groin, the smash in the face, the broken nose, the blood on the pee, the stiff bones and the puffing muscles, the cattle prod and the bottle up the snatch. Dear poet, how would you like to wake up in your own windowless room with your harsh blood wetting in the bed around you? The matches seeping through the springs with your guts. Blank wall above you. Stone brick around you. Sunk in a concrete hole to keep the worms out. With only the dampness to decompose you. Skin a dull yellow in the cold air. Waxy odor. The ghoul has a painted face. With powder and rouge like an actor. He lays in the bed without flowers, without sniffling mothers, without suffering fathers with hands on their hearts. Without family, the poet lies. The holy days click by. Soon his time will be up. Fold him into a drawer. Some marks of his name and number. The day he died, just a scratch on the wall, an unread poem under the bed. There is more to torture than a cell. There is worse kind of hell. Still... A brown horse shivers his glossy sides, twitches his mane, switches his tail. Look, I can see my shadow. He gathers at my feet, moves when I do, jumps, steps, stops, trots a little, turns with me, as if my toe were the axis of the sun, and all things good and all things fun turn with it. Our next reader is a set of readers, Jack and Adele Foley. Um, and I know they're going to read in Tannen. It's always a real treat to hear them read because they do a, a symphonic poetry reading. Um, Jack Foley has published 13 books of poetry and five books of criticism and a chrono encyclopedia of California poetry called Visions and Affiliations, California Poetry from 1940 to, to 2005. He has a radio show on KPFA called Cover to Cover, and it airs every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Um, and his column, Foley's, um, Foley's Book, appears in the Alsop Review. He's also the contributing editor of Poetry Flash. With poet Claire Sue, he, has, um, he co-edits Poetry Hotel Press. Um, and his most recent books are his selected poems, Eyes, and a chapbook called Life. And just so you know, um, you know, when you're, um, the, it's over, both this anthology and books by all of our readers are available. Thank you to, to John over there and Pegasus Books, if you're interested. And Adele Foley is a retirement administrator, an arts activist, and a writer of haiku. She is on the board of Poetry Flash. Her column, High Street New, um, Neighborhood News, appears monthly in the MacArthur Metro. Her poems have appeared in various magazines, in textbooks, and in Columbia University's Press's Internet 
database, the Columbia Granger World of Poetry. And she has out her first collection of poetry called Along the Bloodline. Let's give him a warm welcome. We're going to read two, three poems, actually. <clears throat> Adele and I both have work in the anthology. Um, Adele's going to read her work in the anthology. I'll read mine with her, and then we'll read a, another poem. Sixty years later, after the camps, they were our neighbors, torn from our community. How could this happen? How could this happen? Nurseries and barber shops sold at bargain rates. Sold at bargain rates. Please take the horse and chickens and the fields left fallow. And the fields left fallow, crying for children's laughter, young lovers meeting. Young lovers meeting near barbed wire, guard towers, boredom and hot dust. Boredom and hot dust. Faded memories at last. Soft voices speaking, soft voices speaking to those who did not witness utter disbelief, utter disbelief. It will not happen this time. They are our neighbors. Thank you. This one is, <coughs> is this on? <coughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that this is on. Is this on, guys? Seems to be. Um, Say something, and they'll see. We're yes, yes, now. yes. Hello, hello, yes, hello, yes, hello. Yes, okay, yes. you can hear both of us. <laughs> yeah. Your mic's not as loud. That's yeah. it. My knock's mind is loud. So no, I'll stay one. back here. No, no, we'll do, <laughs> we'll do one mic. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> in yours, Richard. <laughs> this poem is a tribute to the great Los Angeles poet, <clears throat> the great American poet, um, Wanda Coleman. And the title of the poem is the way her name is sometimes interpreted. The name is popularly interpreted to mean wanderer. I've been thrown out of Hollywood night spots for being too rowdy. Wanda. I've picked cotton from the roadside in Fresno. Wanda. Was once pulled over by the CHP for spilling apple juice on the roads of King City. Wanda. Allen Ginsberg hugged me in Oakland. Wanda. I've seen L.A. riot twice. Wanda. I've been blissed out at Mount Shasta, stoned at Wolfgang's, and nauseated in Palm Springs. Wanda. My heart lives in Lancaster, and my grief dwells in the Russian River. Wanda. I am a black Californian, but I am forever married to a New York Jew. Wanda. I was born here. I intend to die here. Wanda. At home. In the cold gray morning comes the forlorn honk of work bomb traffic. I wake to the video news report. The world is going off. Rising, I struggle free of the quilt and wet dreams of my lover dispel, leaving me moist and wanting. In the bathroom, I rinse away illusions, brush my teeth, and unbraid my hair. There are the children to wake, breakfast to conjure, the job, the day laid out before me, the cold corpse of an endless grind. So this is it, I say, to the enigma in the mirror. This is your lot, assignment, relegation. This is your city. I find my way to the picture window. My eyes capture the purple reach of Hollywood's hills, the gold eye of sun mounting the east, the gray anguished arms of Avenue. I, I will, will never, never leave here. here. People speak. Of the violence and dignity. Of your presence. But what? Of the beauty. Of your language. People speak. People speak. Of the speak violence of the and violence dignity, and of, dignity your of your presence. But what? Of the beauty of, of, the your beauty of your language. People speak. People of the violence of and the dignity violence of your presence. But what? Of the beauty of your language. People speak. Of the violence and dignity of your presence. But what? Of the beauty of your language. People speak. Of the violence and dignity of your presence, but what of the beauty of your language? What of the beauty of your language? To paraphrase the concluding sentences of Charlotte's Web. Wanda's Web. It is not often that someone comes along who is a true friend and a good writer. Wanda was both. <laughs> 
Oh, I wish I had a cough drop. I can give you one. We're taking a cough drop break. This <laughs> poem plays upon the etymology <laughs> of the word civilization, which comes from a Latin word, kiwis, or civis, C-I-V-I-S, but they pronounced it kiwis. Uh, if you said kiwis romanus sum, it was a big help if you were in front of a magistrate. St. Paul was beheaded rather than crucified because he was a Roman citizen. It was a big help to him. I mean, they were going to kill him, but they killed him in a milder way <clears throat> than the awful way of crucifixion. Anyway, this poem is called Kiwis Americanus Sum, Civis Americanus Sum. I'm an American citizen. Civilization, civis. Civilization is what happens in cities. Are we witnessing the massive failure of cities? Come up from the farm, come to London, New York, Dublin, be civilized, to civilize, to bring out of barbarism. Are we witnessing the massive failure of cities? New York City. Murder a black man and you can get away with it. Murder a black man and you can get away with it. There are no ambiguities here, no excuses. Murder a black man and you can get away with it. If you're a policeman, you can murder a man. If you're a policeman, you can murder a man. And you can go free, you can go free. If you're a policeman, you can murder a man. The policeman says his job is to protect. The policeman says his job is to protect. To protect is the opposite of murdering someone. The policeman says his job is to protect. Murder a man and you can get away with it. Murder a man and you can get away with it. If you're a policeman, you can murder a man. And you can go free. You can go free. Even if the man tells you you are killing him, he can't breathe. You can go free. You can go free. Murder a black man and you can get away with it. Murder, murder a black, black man, man and you can get, get away with it. it. There, there are no ambiguities here. No excuses. Murder a black man and you can get away with it. If you're a policeman, you can murder a man. If you're a policeman, you can murder a man. And if you can go free, you can go free. If you're a policeman, you can murder a man. The policeman says his job is to protect. The policeman says his job is to protect. To protect is the opposite of murdering someone. The policeman says his job is to protect. Murder a man and you can get away with it. Murder a man and you can get away with it. If you're a policeman, you can murder a man. And you can go free. You can go free. Even if the man tells you, you are killing him, he can't Even breathe. Even tells you you are killing him, he can't breathe. You, you can, can go, go free. free. You, you can, can go, go free. free. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's give him another hand. Woo. Our next reader is Kirk Lumpkin, who has been a really wonderful part of the Bay Area, poetry scene and beyond, um, hosting readings all over and helping to facilitate the annual Watershed Environmental Poetry um, and Ecology Festival, which I've volunteered at for the last 12 years myself. He's also hosted um, open mics at Burning Man. Any burners here? No? Okay, cool. <laughs> He's authored two books of poems called Cohering and In Deep. He does, um, he's part of a poetry and music ensemble called the Word Music Consortium and has, re Continuum, thank you, and has released two CDs, um, and the first self-titled and the second called Sound Poems. He's done featured performances, wow, all over the world, including California <laughs> and England. Um, and in England, he was performing under the auspices of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. He's been on the um, KPFA cover to cover. And he has, for a long time, he just retired, the events coordinator at the Ecology Center. Yes. Do you still go to the farmer's market? Yes. And he's still always at the farmer's market. Thank you, Sharon, for hosting this. Thanks, thanks to City College for having us here. I got a couple of poems in here. Um, the first one is called simply Occupy Poem. Where have you been, my brothers and sisters? Just caught up in the day-to-day -day of making a living. Lost in TV shows where the advertisers bought 
time in your mind. Or somewhere out in cyberspace, trying to live some life that marketing departments made up for you. Or too drunk, too stoned, too medicated to care, or at least to do anything about it. I understand. I've been there myself. And we've all been occupied by corporate America and the military-industrial complex, just like our government has. But it's time to come back to ourselves. Occupy your own life fully and deeply. Occupy your own body, your own mind, your heart. Occupy the present moment. Occupy the place that you live, your neighborhood, your community, your farm, your watershed, your bioregion, your continent, your planet, and damn it, your government. Occupying not. Like invaders, colonizers, developers, or corporate profiteers. But like native citizens like native plants, reclaiming, re-inhabiting their own, reaching down roots that connect us to our billions of brothers and sisters around the world, to Mother Earth, to the life energy flowing through all living things. We can become a homegrown, grassroots, rainbow volunteer army of love occupying the soul of America. And then a poem that's uh, not in the anthology, but um, follows the, hopefully, the provocative activist uh, theme, it's partially here and it's partially international in scope. It's called A Midsummer's Nightmare. August 6, 2012, Berkeley. Halfway between the summer solstice and the fall equinox, midsummer. Time for vacation and to play in the woods as innocent is animals and sprites, children and young lovers. But instead, because our nation never admits its wrongs, continues to empower our demons and constantly feeds the war machine, we feel called to gather in remembrance of the bombing of Hiroshima. Nightmare flash burned into the living flesh and DNA of history. Those who have fallen in love and other well-meaning fools clearly cannot be trusted in all circumstances. Like those who thought it a great idea to have all the birds in Shakespeare's plays come to live in New York City with the result that starlings are an exotic invasive species across this continent. But for the invasive species looking back from your mirror, to continue to trust our government and the corporations after all you have seen and what you know to be lies would be an act of denial that becomes complicity. Turning to leave Ohlone Park for a second event commemorating the first attack with an atomic bomb on the horizon, huge black cloud spreading from a fire at the Chevron oil refinery that will send more than 15,000 residents of Richmond, California to the hospital. It is time to leave what's left of the fossil fuel in the ground. Stop the chain reaction of trauma begets trauma begets trauma time to leave the atoms to their natural wholeness and finally understand that the real power 
is inside us. And though we cannot choose the dreams we have, we can choose the dreams that we pursue. And, and one very tiny, tiny final poem. I have two poems in the anthology. This one in a very different mood. Um, well, it's just good for us all to remember we've all got parents, and like ourselves, they change over time. This is called Two Poems for My Father. One. Your spirit opened up so wide, it could not be held inside of you. Your soul, it grew to be so sweet that it was time to be harvested. Two, looking back after cleaning out my parents' apartment, golden dust motes dancing, inside an empty room. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, our next reader is uh, Sharon Dubiago. And um, if you've ever wondered what it's like to um, be the, um, have a mother who's a, a, a writer and a poet and is just absolutely fabulous, ask Sean Dubiago, who is our wonderful um, humanities teacher at Berkeley City College. So we have, we want to thank Sharon for all that you brought to us through your daughter. <laughs> okay. Sharon Dubiago's memoir, My Father's Love, Portrait of the Poet as a Young Girl, was a finalist for the Northern California Book Awards in Creative Nonfiction. Um, Love in the Streets, selected in New Poems, University of Pittsburgh, um, received the Glenna Luce Distinguished Poetry Award and was a, a finalist for the Patterson, New Jersey Poetry Award. Um, Sharon Dubiago has written two dozen books of poetry and prose. Wow. Um, and most notably, the epic poem, Hard Country, and a book-length poem, South America, Mihiha, um, as well as a poetry collection, Body and Soul, and her short story collection, El Nino, and the book of seeing with one's own eyes. Um, her new poetry book that is... Um, um, just coming out is Naked to the Earth. Let's give her a big warm welcome. Thank, thank you for reading that poem to and of Wanda Coleman. She and I were born within a year of each other, within a mile of each other <laughs> in LA, South Central LA. Uh, she's major in my life, sometimes not so positively. <laughs> I left LA when I was 30, so, and she wrote that poem, I Will Never Leave Here, <laughs> as a result. Um, I hope I have enough time left to write a, my story about Wanda Coleman, extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary spirit and poet. I'm going to read <coughs> one poem, which will take up my time, and it's from South America, Mi'iha, and it's because it's uh, it when, when my daughter, Sean, who's here and teaches here and has for quite a while now, um, when she was 15, uh, she and I traveled basically by El Buso to Machu Picchu from Mendocino, <laughs> and I wrote this book-length poem. <coughs> South America, Mihiha. Um, and uh, uh, a, of course, big story behind all that, but um, I needed, I needed, I needed to connect with my daughter, Mihiha. And I didn't, and I couldn't, I didn't know how to. I, there was no, I just couldn't, I couldn't figure out what was wrong, but something was wrong. 
And she sort of wanted to go to Europe, and I knew that would be a mistake. It would just be <laughs> wine and dinner and, <laughs> and guys. <laughs> so we went, to, we went to, by El Buso, the bus, to Machu Picchu, which was not an easy journey, but it was very significant and very wonderful. This is, w this is a poem called My Little Money Changer. She was, she's 15. She's already a head taller than me. Um, she's um, is at the border of um, <coughs> Ecuador and Peru. In the morning at the border between Ecuador and Peru, the money changers surround us as we descend the all-night El Buso. To the heat, the screams smell of dead meat, human piss of Waikias. Miha takes their offers, calculates on her small machine, looks down in the eyes of each Mui Malo. Six young men, black suits, black briefcases, shout back their counter offers. Again she bends to the gold object in her hand, fall of her hair, a veil from them, calculates, shakes, a spray of gold, no. They haggle as we walk, stopping and stumbling beneath the load of our things, our cramped bus bones, our two blonde heads over the dark puddle they make, out shouting each other the heat and dust. My head pounds from lack of sleep, lack of coffee, the 12 hour, 12,000 foot descent. But my tall Amazon amazes them, calculates, shakes her head, no, nada, she won't be cheated. <laughs> Out the window, the money changers gather, watch us eat. We share a chicken, drink coffee. Through the window, they mime their offers, play with their cocks. She counts, licks her lips, taps the long, graceful dance of her index finger, her calculator, lo siento. In the post office, they make their offers again, having trailed us, shouting their deals, the mile-long putrid street. She raises her left eyebrow, puts her right hand on her high hip, shakes her wild head. You must be kidding. My me little bullfighter stands her ground. They make their offers as we move through customs, hours through the dust, official papers, silent prayers, their eyes through the walls of Los Banos, not imaginable, the filth, the smells, the eyes, on us as we move down the markets, the open stalls, through the shouts and glares of the merchants, the mothers, the heat rising with the day, the stink of the people, the police, the army, passaporte, passaporte. Everyone has warned us, the books, the signs, the soldiers, change your money inside Ecuador, warning, do not enter Peru without money, but my little squirt, my 15-year-old, will not be screwed. Their numbers grow to see the sight. Now a dozen, now two dozen come running to see my girl, her calculator, her no, no, no. Little black-suited men at our waists gather, gathered in the Waikia's dust to make their F offers, to play their games, to watch this girl, me Rubia, me too, I suppose, two giant electric light bulbs. She bends, blinding glitter of bronze, they peer up, dark and male, collective around her, Cartagena, Catalina, Galatea. Her astonishing hands of light cast the spell of numbers and light. Her grin, her unabashed love of this game, center stage, her poor mama, all the sexy nuances of nada, siastole and diastole, la senorita si, la senora no. <laughs> They know we can't hold out. They see La Senora would have bet first offer this dirt in the mouth, headache, this pain of a place, this dickering for soles. Don't worry, she instructs, as we come to the ditch, the border of Ecuador and Peru, as we come to their centuries-old border war, aching and hot, the weight of our things, the guns and the police, guns and the starving, guns and the soldiers, mi hijos, no comprende, their cruel baby faces. The leader emerges, the one they ran and got, the one to whom they all acquiesce, a man my age, El Hancho, they will win this war yet, sits down on his haunches, haunches. Someone brings a chair, arms across his chest, he knows we don't dare cross. She crosses. 
I follow. Roar of protests, stench of and cadaver of donkey, stiff legs, a finger to the air, Ecuador and Peru, a naked baby wandering the ditch, inside, outside, both countries, buzzards, each bank, watch, lift their wings. The money changer, changers get permission, follow us over. The police, the armies of both countries, the bus drivers, the merchants, the buzzards, women, children, and old folks gather to watch. And a young woman we will see all over northern Peru, photograph of a saint, March 7, 1914, December 29, 1940, stares down from the immigration wall through the dusty artificial flowers at her breasts, the dusted rifles at her, at her brother's chests. El hombre makes the offer mi hija has held out for all morning, rate of the banks. She looks at me, winks, looks him in the eye. Si, sí, says it so beautifully. Muy bien, si, sí, roar of the crowd. But Pero, the man, finds he too is in a foreign country. Que lastima, how pitiful, he has no change. From the crowd, a hush. So she makes her offer, my little money changer. And now he is the one being cheated. He throws up his hands, I'm afraid he will cry. For a kiss, he counters in English, unbelieving, losing face, never dreaming, even I. Quicker than a calculator, more blinding than God, shocking, even Sumadre, before he knows what hit him. Me little conquistador, goddess saint, banker, bends to his cheek, smack of saliva, slipping los dineros from his fingers. Struts off, vamanos, mom, with our exchange. To the deafening roar, soldiers, police, merchants, creatures they call dogs, buzzards, lo y los niños, both countries, su madre, following. <laughs> That's wonderful. Our next reader is Richard Solberg, who I, I've known for so long, and he's done some good critiquing of my poems. <laughs> Um, Richard Silberg is a poet, a critic, a translator, and an associate editor of Poetry Flash. His poetry book, Deconstruction of the Blues, received the Penn um, Oakland Josephine Miles Award in 2006 and was nominated for Northern California Book Awards. He's also the author of Reading the Spheres, um, A Geography of Contemporary American Poetry. Um, and they're, those are really great essays. They are hilarious and informative and tell so much about the, the poetry scene in the last 20 years here, even more. Um, he's also worked on um, several translations, one of them, Three-Way Tavern by South Korean poet Ko An, that he co-translated with Claire Yu. Um, and for which he won uh, Northern California Book Awards. And he's also another book of translation, This Side of Time, also by Koyan, um, came out in 2012. And his most recent book is Horses, New and Selected Poems. Uh, he's a wonderful person. I've known him for many years, and I'm very honored to welcome him up here. And All right, man. Uh, this is this is, a, I, I thank uh, Sharon. Actually, uh, she is uh, one of Poetry, our Poetry Flash editors, and she's a wonderful person, too. Uh, <laughs> this is my uh, anthology poem. It's called George Hackett Simpson and the Three Sad Cigarettes. I'm too old, I'm too old for this shit. As if he could step off the street, his face like gutted flame into a school for accountancy. Limps close on a bad knee to hit me up for change and stays to embroider his life, nom an improbable PhD in physics, rambles in Japanese honor families, wouldn't back down to no one, and blurs to a glow the coming of the hero. 
He hits on a street dude for three cigarettes, then refuses one to a pockmarked black man who begs him to buy it with some pennies in a cup, pops back at me, ferret intense. Fucking cops, he says. Fucking cops, red dime on his cheek, the size of a bullet hole, keep telling us to split. They don't even know what reality is. With fawning eyes, he arrogates reality to us, him and me, dreaming atolls. We beat for a while, together in the street lights, the silent night air. Okay, this, this next, uh, this last poem, I'm only gonna do two. This is for Baina Witt, who, uh, Cafe Babar was the beginning of spoken word in San Francisco. And uh, Baina Witt was a poet. She was a sex worker, like a lot of the women at Babar. And this is a poem about her romance with Artie Mitchell. And it's called, the Golden Gate. Drizzling clown, guttering diva, but luminous, love creature. I'm trying to understand these heartbroken poems for Artie Mitchell, slave poems. How else to say love poems? Maybe he was Christ. Probably he was just the bald, sandy punk in the paper who projected no light, shadow, absence in your poems, shot to death by his punk brother, Mitchell Brothers, cufflinks of the SF porn industry. I'm trying to remember the story you told of distance and speed, being chauffeured across the Golden Gate, cocaine and slavey sex. Distance between actual fucking and screen-sized cocks and cunts, performer and audience, self, and horizon, all I can understand is distance, yearning across a gap, loving the loss by losing the other, sucking the loss, the bullet hole. 